Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. A couple of things. First of all, if I don't get to your question, I'm very sorry I film these on Tuesday or Wednesday. If you want to guarantee to get your question asked, please get it to me by Monday at the latest. Uh, if I miss your question, I'm very sorry. Just ask it again. I'll get onto it the following week. Also, uh, these are literally answers that come off the cuff. I haven't read the questions beforehand. I haven't done any research. You're getting my raw, unfiltered opinion. If there's a question that I think would require a longer thought out answer, I'll do a video about it and you'll see that video popping up in the next few weeks. Having said that, there's a ton of questions. There's an absolute ton of questions this week. So we're going to get straight into it. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for every single person that's ever left a question on here. I really appreciate it. Now, with that being said, let's get on to this week's Q&A. Okay, so the first question is from Justin Hutchins. And Justin says, hi, Craig, in your opinion, what's the best pen through bill to buy? I just can't decide. I looked at the perfect pen, but there's so many bad reviews on Penguin, it put me off. I see Tenyo's got one and I've seen a few others, but what's the best one to get? Right, a couple of things. First of all, I think that, um, I personally think if you want to put a pen through a bill, perfect pen is the way to go. Now, I got the original John Cornelius one and I have the new one. Ryland has the new one as well. I really like the new one. And one of the reasons that I like it so much is because it can be examined. I've never, I don't know what the bad reviews say. I'm talking about somebody who's been using it since they got it about a year ago. I've never had it go wrong. I've never had any problems. Um, I love the fact that you can do the pen through the bill. Now, normally when you do the pen through the bill, you're in a situation where you've got something that you need to get rid of, right? But with the John Cornelius pen through the bill, that's not the case. You pull it out and immediately you can hand it out for examination and it's locked and it's examinable, which is great. And it works as a normal pen and all of that fun stuff. So if you're going to push a pen through a bill, I would recommend using the perfect pen over and above any other pen. I do think that the Sharpie through bill, you know, you'll see a lot of Sharpies being advertised. I think they look good. I think the advantage of having a Sharpie go through a bill is that a magician carries a Sharpie around with them anyway. So because a magician carries a Sharpie around with them anyway, there's a, you know, it's it's kind of a, almost like an EDC organic type object to put through. You know, if you're going to take out a pen specifically to just push through a bill, but you're not put using the pen in any other aspect of your performance, the pen by its very nature becomes suspicious. Whilst if you put, take a Sharpie that you've been using for signed cards or whatever, and you push that through the bill, well, that becomes less suspicious. So Sharpie through bill is quite good as well. Um, the the thing that I've been playing around with a lot recently, and I missed this when it first came out, but I picked it up a couple of months ago, uh, a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm really enjoying playing with it, is Smooth by Nicholas Lawrence and Penguin Magic. Now with this, with Smooth, you actually push a chapstick through a bill. But what makes it really nice is it's this slow motion penetration really slow motion and then you can show it on both sides and pull it out and as soon as you do everything's examinable so if you haven't checked out if you if you're wanting to push something through a bill and you ha you're not completely sold on a pen have a look at smooth because there's a couple of aspects of that gimmick that take it above and beyond the normal pen through bill and i'm really enjoying playing around with it at the moment i'm taking it out to a gig tomorrow to trial run it for the first time but i think it's going to be uh it's going to be good Okay, so the next question is again from Justin Hutchins, and he says, Hi, Craig, you've got John Bannon's Spin Doctor and Royal Scam. You have to throw one in the bin and perform the other one. Which do you choose and why? That's very difficult, isn't it? Because they're both great. I, lo I love both of them for different reasons. Um, I'd say I would stick with Royal Scam. I think there's more magical moments with Royal Scam. I think Royal Scam is in the essence of a perfect packet trick. You know, there's lots of magical moments that happen. It's very, very easy to follow. It's all examinable. There's a couple of kicker endings that people don't see coming. They assume the trick is one thing and then it's something else. And then, as I say, you've got the first kicker ending uh, of the batch changing color. You've got the second kicker ending of the, uh, the faces changing to get the royal flush. There's just so much to love about it. And as I say, it's very easy to follow. You don't need a table. It can ha happen in the spectator's hands and it's instantly examinable. So I would say that I would use Royal Scam and, and ditch the other one because for me, Royal Scam is about as close to a perfect packet trick that you can get. Okay, so the next question is from Hypnosis TV who says, Hi Craig, can I 
can I send you an idea for a magic trick and get your opinion on it? If so, how can I send it to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, send it to Craig at magictv.org. Uh, Craig at magictv.org and uh, I will get to it. I have to be honest with you, I can't guarantee when I'm going to get to anything like that. I am incredibly busy at the moment. I mean, I'm filming this on a Tuesday. Tomorrow I'm doing, uh, I'm in Blackpool all day. Then I've got an illusion show in Sheffield. Uh, Thursday I'm in the office all day. Then I've got a close-up job in the evening. Friday I'm in uh, Luton for an illusion show through the day and into the evening. Saturday I'm performing in London. Sunday I'm doing a training day in London for non-stop kids. Monday I'm back in the office, then I'm performing. In the, like every day I've got something on. It's crazy at the moment for me, crazy, crazy busy. But I will get to it at some point. But the best way to get something in front of me is to send it to craig at magictv.org. Okay, so the next question, more of a statement is from Richie Ross, uh, Rosson, who says, also on Miser's Dream, Levant's brilliant three DVD uh, disc set on it is amazing. That's very true, Richie. I completely forgot about that. How you can forget about Levant when it comes to Miser's Dream, I don't know. But yes, I would say if you want to learn every aspect of the Miser's Dream, for sure, check out Levant's DVDs. It's great. But I still say, if you're just wanting to learn one routine to perform the Miser's Dream and it's to a family audience, I'd still say Chris K. Parts DVD is the best one to go for. Okay, so the next question is from Stephen Devon Ra uh, Rocks, I think. How are you doing, buddy? You okay? Hope you're well, Stephen. Uh, he says, hi, Craig. Love your channel. Thanks very much. I am the only magician in my town, okay? And there are always the same people at this show or another show, and I can't just buy new equipment all the time. Any suggestions as it's very expensive to keep buying? Um, okay, well... You know, it's the old expression, isn't it? Di Vernon said that if you have a thousand forces and one revelation, then you have one card trick. But if you have one force and a thousand different revelations, you have a thousand card tricks. And the same is true of anything, whether you're talking about the word show here, I don't know if you're doing a close-up show or a stage show or if it's close-up performances or whatever, but the advice holds true over either or all or both. Um, in that think about the magic that you do and think about how you can change it. So, for example, let's say you do a card revelation, right? And the card revelation is that you've forced a card and you revealed it with a prediction, okay? Something simple like that. Well, how can you change it from a prediction to something else? Because then the spectator will think that it's a totally different trick. So, for example, could you get invisible ink? and draw invisible ink over your arm of the selected card. So you have someone pick a card and then you put ash over your hand and it turns into the card. You know, that's that uh, you, they see the card right there on your on your arm. Could you have it so that the card is um, loaded underneath your close up pad? Could you have it so that you've got a big revelation that that's wrong and then you open it the other side and it's correct? Think about all the different ways that you can think about. All you have to do is get yourself a pen and a piece of paper. And you don't need money for this. You don't need to buy new props all of the time. All you need to do is just write down on a piece of paper every idea for a trick that you could possibly think of. I want to do this. 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 And then think about different ways of making it happen. Think about how you can actually do that. And use your creativity. Don't buy other people's tricks, but come up with your own ways of doing things. You've got magical knowledge. You're a magician. You've just said you're the only magician in your town. So you know how to do stuff. I'm sure you know how to. Uh, I know, I'm sure you know the basics of sleight of hand. Uh, you probably know advanced sleight of hand. I don't know. So think about all of this stuff and think about how you can actually apply it to new tricks. So rather than just buying something off the shelf and presenting it, think about what else that you can do. Think about different ways that you can actually use those skills that you have at your disposal. There's a million different ways that you can do things. You just have to think it through. If you've got a coin vanish, making a coin disappear, that's one trick. 
Making a coin disappear and appear underneath a mat, there's another trick. Making a coin disappear and appear in a deck next to a card that they thought of, that's another trick. Doing a flourish where the coin jumps from here to here and here to here and here to here, that's another trick. Taking a coin, doing that same vanish, but pushing it up through the table, that's another trick. Taking a coin and making it jump from over here to over here, that's another trick. Taking the coin and making it disappear and appear on somebody's shoulder, that's another trick. Taking the coin, making it disappear and it appears underneath your watch, that's another trick. Taking the coin, making it disappear and appear underneath somebody else's watch, that's another trick. Taking a coin, making it disappear and making it land in a glass, that's another trick. Taking a coin and make it penetrate through a glass, that's another trick. Taking a coin and making it turn into a dollar bill and having the dollar bill go into your, uh, having the coin go into the pocket where the dollar bill was, that's another trick. But it all relies on one coin vanish. One coin vanish is one trick, but it can become 20, 20, 30, 40 tricks. And that's before you start using something else other than the coin. Take a pretzel, make it disappear. That's a completely different trick. Now you've got the vanishing pretzel. Take a pretzel, smush it up into bits, take those bits, do a vanish and have a real pretzel here. And now you're doing a restored pretzel. That's another trick. Think about what you can take a lighter, have a lighter disappear. That's another trick. Think about all of the different moves that you know. Do you know, uh, do you do a paddle move? Have you got a paddle trick? Brilliant. Have you thought about doing that with a knife? Have you thought about doing that with a lighter? Have you thought about doing that with a lollipop stick? Have you thought about doing that with whatever? The point is you can do so much using the moves and the techniques and the principles that are already at your disposal. Think about all the moves that you do. Think about all of the tricks that you know. Think about all the techniques that you know. Think about all of this and, and, and see what would happen if you change the premise. If I use this instead of this, what would happen? If I use this instead of this, what would this happen? If I take this force and I use it for something else, what will that look like? And that's how you can massively increase your repertoire without actually even needing to do any extra shopping for new magic tricks. And Stu Bateman says, uh, Ryland is in Preston where I live in Preston. Would love to see him perform again. He was awesome at the Bear Pit at Blackpool. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, he was in Preston last Wednesday doing a show in a theatre there. Uh, for a bunch of kids. He had an amazing time. He's going to be back. I mean, Preston's not a million miles away from uh, Blackpool. He's going to be back at Blackpool at the House of Secrets quite regularly over the summer. I'm in Blackpool myself on Wednesday, and I'm going and seeing Russ Brown because he wants to speak about multiple dates for Ryland over the next couple of months. So keep an eye on his socials. He'll be advertising where he's going to be. And also keep an eye on his website. He's got an events page on there. But if you want to see him, he's going to be at the House of Secrets again very, very soon. Okay, so the next question is from Adrian Sutra, and Adrian says, Hi, Craig. I really appreciated your recent motivational video for hobbyists. Thanks very much. Being a hobbyist myself, I have a rather long-winded question. I sometimes try and adapt language-dependent tricks to my native tongue, which is German. For instance, I have designed my own German backwards business card inspired by the English one, which comes with Jeff Kaler's ultimate networking tool. I'm currently working on a German version of Max Maven's routine. This will be much more than a simple translation because it includes memory work and the mnemonics work quite differently in Germany or in German. I would like to share this work with the magic community, not in order to make money, and certainly not to try and rip off the original creator. Yet publishing these in one form or another and getting credit for my effect would be great. What's the best way to proceed? Okay. Um, well, first of all, just check with all of the sources you know just 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 get permission from everybody like jeff kayler and so on and so forth but in terms of releasing the material there's a couple of different options now the first option is reach out to them uh, if you want to just have it published so that it's out there you could publish it in a magazine right so you could reach out to magic scene magazine or you could reach out to genie or you could reach out to vanish magazine and you could say hey uh, I want to do a, a course on, or I want to do an article on translating, um, you know, and, and, and the whole thing, pitch them the whole thing and explain it to them. They might find it interesting and they might want you to do an article that's published in one of their magazines, which is quite prestigious even now. So that's the first option. The second option is signing up for the Penguin Partner Programme. 
which you can sign up for for free. And once you're in the Penguin Partner Program, you can submit any idea to Penguin and they will um, they will publish it on your behalf. It will appear on their your newest items list. It'll appear inside there. Uh, that's how a lot of people publish material, uh, especially people that are new to creating. And even now, you know, some of the best creators um, still publish material through the Penguin Partner Program. So that's another way that you can actually do it. Contact Penguin. Uh, or, or apply for the Penguin Partner Program. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can write an ebook about the whole thing and publish it in library.com. Library is a fantastic resource. Library, L Y B, uh, library, but with a Y. Um, if you go to uh, library, you can you can sell your ebooks through there. You can create an ebook, uh, spend some time over it, make it look really nice. You could even include links in there to YouTube videos so people can see uh, examples and so on and so forth. You know, make it look really nice, and then publish it through library. That's another way you can do it. There's lots of resources and lots of ways that you can actually publish material beyond going through one of the big companies, and that will allow you to publish anything and everything. So there's three different ways that you can actually go about this. Okay, so the next question is from Josh Josh, and Josh Josh says, Hi Craig, hi Josh. I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on openly displaying your price rates directly on your website versus requiring potential clients to request a free consultation or getting a free quote via email, text or telephone call. While looking up current rates for magicians in my area to help me decide on my pricing, most if not all of the websites I looked at had the latter option and I couldn't find a price anywhere on the websites. As a business owner, I can see the value of requiring a consultation so as to help convince potential clients that your services are worth the price. However, as a consumer, I've always found it annoying when I've had to request quotes on services requiring me to give them an email and get put on an emailing list instead of giving me the information I'm looking for. When that happens, I typically dismiss, dismiss that specific service altogether because I don't want to deal with the hassle. What have you found to be the most affecting method of informing clients of your pricing and why? Um, realistically, I, I don't include prices on my website and there's a, or on any website for any company that I'm involved in. And there's a couple of different reasons that I don't do that. And the first reason is, realistically, it's impossible to give people a quote without knowing more about their events. Because if I just said, hey, close-up magic is this much, a stage show is this much, they might think, oh, I want close-up magic. But once I've spoken to them, I actually kind of realize that the best thing for them is a stage show. So, for example, there's somebody who um, messaged in uh, for Slightly Unusual, my, uh, my company, a couple of days ago. And they said, hey, uh, I want an hour of close-up magic. I want an hour of mix and mingle close-up magic. Can I have a price, please? And I, I, I got back to them and I was like, well, tell me a little bit about the events, first of all. Turned out there's only going to be five people in the house. And the reason they only want an hour of close-up magic is because there's only going to be five people. But in essence, close-up magic wouldn't really work for five people. Um, so I suggested that they have a parlor show. And I explained why a parlor show would be better. And I said, look, we can do a 45-minute parlor show. It'll really give people the VIP experience. It'll really, you know, and I, I went through all of the reasons why I would, uh, uh, I would go for a parlor show. And then I gave them a quote for a parlor show, um, which is more expensive than the price for an hour of close-up magic, right? Now, if I'd have just said, this is an hour of close-up magic, this is how much the price is, if they booked it, they'd be booking the wrong thing. And then when I come back to them and I tell them, well, you need this and the price is higher, they'd be like, well, hang on, why is the price high? You're still only there for an hour. So it avoids confusion by having them contact me. I'm able to work out exactly what they're looking for and I can give them a quote based on their specific event as opposed to, hey, this is the price for absolutely everything. The second reason is from a sales point of view, I've got a sales team in there. Matt is in the sales team. Liz is in the sales team. I've got a big sales team of people who whose job is literally to sell people packages now um if if they if the prices are on the website here's the thing i'm then competing on price i can make my website look amazing and that's absolutely fine but there's a lot of websites out there that are, there that are really good so by competing on price I'm not being given a chance to show everybody why they should book me over somebody else. So if my price is more expensive and there's another person that's cheaper, 
I can't put across what extra I'm going to do because they're literally just basing it on price. But if they contact me, I can then start the sales process and I can talk, uh, I can paint pictures and I can explain to them exactly why I am the best or my company is the best option for their event. And, and that's very important. It really is very, very important. I can't stress how important that is. Um, the sales process will work much better if you have somebody who isn't aware of the price and they're contacting you. Uh, and also, when they do contact you, it gives you an idea of how impulse they are when it comes to your services. Because when people contact you, they typically send, say one of two things. They'll either say, I want to check your availability or some variation than that. Or are you available on this date? Or come to me and say, I want to know how much you charge. I need a price. Now, if they come in and they go, I need a price, it means that they're price shopping. They're looking around. They're not specifically looking for me or my company. They're looking for a price. And so I know I need to impulse them and I need to use a little bit of fear of loss in order to get them into change their mindset around a little bit in order to get them into a position where they realize that, you know, I, I, they might not get me if they if they, you know, if they don't hurry. Whilst if um, they come to me and go, hey, I want to check your availability, they are definitely impulsed in having me or my company and I can approach the sales call or the conversation over email in a completely different way. So that that's a couple of different reasons why. Uh, there's no right or wrong. Look, I know people that put their prices on their website because they don't want any hassle. They don't want to be phoned. Those people will say, hey, you know, I put my prices on my website. So the only time people contact me is if they want to book me. And that's all well and good. But I run a company, um, you know, which deals with thousands and thousands and thousands of bookings every single year. I want as many people to contact me as possible because I want to have the opportunity to convert those booking, those inquiries into a booking. Um, but it, there's no right or wrong just because this is the right way for me to do it. And this is the way that I personally think is the best way to do it. It doesn't mean that it is. Um, but, you know, I, I, I know you said that you'll probably just like dismiss it because you don't like the hassle. I totally understand that. But most people aren't like that based on the data that I'm seeing within my company. OK, so the next question is from Tom Gibbons. And Tom says, hi, Craig, I'm 15 and I'm learning mentalism. When performing, what would you suggest as a justification stroke explanation to what I'm doing? I don't feel like reading body language or using psychology does. Uh, what? Uh, what? Uh, I, I don't believe like reading body language or using psychology does uh, would really be believable at this age. Okay, so what you're saying is you're 15, you want to start performing mentalism, but you don't want to use body language or psychology and stuff like that um, because that might not be something that would be believable with a 15 year old. Okay, cool. Right. Okay. Um, I get that. I totally get that. So you're wanting to know what justification explanation you can be doing. Well, but I always say that when it comes to, and I'm not a mentalist by any stretch of the imagination, but I normally find that the best thing to do in this situation is bring it into what you like to do personally. So for example, if you enjoyed playing football, for example, you might start the presentation by saying, hey, I'm going to try something with you now. Now, ever since I was two or three years old, I've played football. Now, when you play football, you almost develop a second sight. It almost feels like you can read minds. It almost feels like you're psychic. You're not, but it almost feels that way because I can tell because of how long I've played football for and how much time I've practiced doing it. I can tell where the ball is at all times and I can even anticipate what other players are going to do. I can anticipate that that player is going to run into that position. I can anticipate that that person is going to kick that ball over to that position right now. And that's why I become such a good footballer, because I can put myself into the position of the players and I can anticipate what they're doing. And I found that I can take this information and I can take this experience that I've had on the football field and I can relate it to other things as well. And I'm going to use this as a as a, an experiment with you. We're going to try something, OK? And I'm going to use my experience as a footballer to try and anticipate the decisions that you're going to make. Now, that all sounds really believable. 
And that all, and it's something that everybody is relatable to. Everybody knows what football is. Everybody knows that when you're a good footballer, you do anticipate what other players do. And it's believable for a 15 year old to really enjoy football. But that only works if you're into football. If you're not into football, what else are you into? Because it can work with anything. So for example, snooker or pool, you could use the same concept with pool. Hey, I've been playing pool or snooker since I was two years old and I really enjoy playing uh, playing pool. And what I found is I can I can anticipate the moves that the player's going to be, are going to be taking. I pretty much know before they're gonna pot the ball, which ball they're going to pot. And you can go down that route. Exactly the same thing, but you're applying it to something else. You could even apply it to watching television. Hey, ever since I was a kid, I've always really found that I've been super interested in TV shows where there's a mystery that needs to be solved. If you've ever watched a murder mystery and you have to guess who done it, I'm always able to guess who done it. My mom hates me because she loves watching murder mysteries and she's always trying to work it out. And I'll just tell her within a couple of minutes, it's that person. It started off when I was a kid, I was watching things like Paw Patrol and I always knew who the bad guy was. And I always knew which dog was gonna save the day because I could just anticipate this stuff. It was like a second sight. And then as I got older and I started uh, reading books, I started reading books about mysteries and, and, and people going on adventures and getting into trouble and I was able to anticipate how the book was ending. Now I'm not saying I'm psychic or anything like that but I've just immersed myself in this sort of thing for so long that I've got to the point now where I can kind of use that experience and ability to read what people or anticipate what people are going to be doing before they do it. Let me show you and then what you do is you you frame the trick to relate to what it is that you've just said. So if you're if you've talked about football, for example, you could say, are you a football fan? You are, okay, brilliant. I want you to think of any player, any player in the world. Can you do that for me? Write their name down, fantastic. Put it away inside this wallet. No way I can know that name, right? I want you to imagine in your head now, you're playing football and there's only two people on the pitch. There's you and there's that person that you wrote down. I want to imagine that you're kind of going one-on-one -on -one with each other and you're just passing the ball back and forth to each other. And then you look up and they're looking at you right in the face. And then they turn around and they walk off and you see their name written on the back of their shirt. I want you to really vividly see their name. Now, I want you to think of the first letter of that name and boom, you're into it. So that's what I would do. I would just bring it back to whatever it is that you're interested in and make the presentation about that and make the justification about something that you've done your whole life that's allowed you to be able to anticipate the behavior that people are doing. Hope that helps. Okay, so the next question is from Grok Magician. And Grok Magician says, Hi Craig, thanks for all the effort you're putting in to help the magic community. In my act, which I perform alone, I produce my rabbit, Bubbles, from a fire pan. Okay, then Bubbles picks a chosen card with her teeth. All right. Then I put bubbles in a flip over rabbit ringer that I built. Just before doing the fire pan, I do hippity hoppity rabbits. That's an incredible act. I'm not, I don't do magic with livestock, but okay, cool, man. Uh, my question is when I load bubbles into a fire pan and stuck behind my nightclub table for approximately five to seven seconds where the audience can't see me, what should I be saying to my audience? I don't want my rabbit act as an opener. I have literally no experience in this sort of thing at all, man. I have no experience. So your question is, you need to load a rabbit into a fire pan behind a nightclub table for about seven seconds where the audience can't see me. What should I be saying to my audience? I have no idea. Um, I would go down one of two approaches. The first approach would be to change where you load bubbles from. And that's very, that's dependent on the environment, right? That's very much dependent on the environment. But whatever the environment it is, see if you can change it. So if you're performing on stage, have bubbles in the wing and say, hey, I just need to get something from over here. I need to get a special pan. Just give me one second. I'm gonna come back with this. And you're loading them in for the wings. If you haven't got wings, have you got a separate table that you could load from? So you've got your main table that you're working from and you've got another table over here. And you walk over to there to get that table. And as, you, you know, as you're going over and you're walking over 
you're loading from another place. That's one option. If you can't change the environment or you can't change where you load from, you know, I mean, this is just a classic example of just making sure that everything's filled with dead time. So just recap to the audience. You say it's only seven seconds. So you've just done hip hippity hoppity rabbits, right? And then you're going to go and grab a fire pan to produce bubbles. Um, so you could say, just say something, anything as you're going over there, just say something. So you say, what you just saw there was with two rabbits, but obviously those rabbits aren't real. Um, uh, but I gave them names. I gave each one of those rabbits names. Uh, one's called Bob and one's called Fred. Now I was going to call them bubbles, but I didn't call them bubbles. And the reason I didn't call them bubbles is because I've actually got a real rabbit called rat bubbles. Well, I say it's a real rabbit. It's not a real rabbit. It's an invisible rabbit. I've got it right here. And by this time you're back with the pan. I've got it right here. This is bubbles. Now you can't see bubbles, but let's see if we can do a bit of magic. Look, we'll set this pan on fire. One, two, three, boom, there's bubbles. Everyone give bubbles a big round of applause. So you're just talking crap and covering the length of time it takes you to load the rabbit into the pan and come back into position um that's what i would do just think about any dead time that you've got in your show and what you can say to cover that dead time and the fact that you've just done something with fake rabbits in in hippity hobbity rabbits gives you something to talk about as you're going to go and get the fire pan so, uh, as I say, I've got very limited experience in this sort of stuff, but that's what I would do. Hopefully that, uh, that helps a little bit. Okay, so the next question is from Seth Howard. And Seth says, hi, Craig. Hey, Seth. This doesn't happen with my close-up, but with my stage act, it feels like I'm talking at the audience rather than talking to them. Not sure if that's how I'm perceiving it because I'm used to more intimate performances. Any words or advice on improving on that? Uh, well, first of all, you need to know if this is a real problem or if it's something that you're perceiving in your head. So the first thing I'd do is the next stage show that you do, go and film it from the back of the room. Uh, just set up a GoPro or something or set up an iPhone and just film the whole thing from the back of the room. Because when you film it, you're going to see, um, you're going you're gonna to get more... Um, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get, you, you watch it back and you'll get more of an idea as to whether this is a problem or not. Now, if it is a problem, um, what you need to do is you just need to think about ad libs. You think you need to think about ad libbing. Mark Bennett is one of the best that I've seen do this. John Archer, uh, John Archer is another person who's very good at it. It's the whole idea of going off script and just chatting to the audience. So you come out on stage and pick people in the row yeah hey my name's craig i'm a magician uh welcome to the show thanks very much for coming out tonight guys i'm going to show you some magic you look very excited about that so what's your name john this is john everybody john how you do you, you're not looking at me john i think the reason you're not looking at me is you're a little bit afraid that i'm going to bring you up on stage i'm not john are you having a good day you are brilliant you don't need to come up john but i do need you to help me with something from the day is that okay and just kind of stuff like that, you know, you're kind of picking people out in the audience and you're chatting to them from different parts. And one of the big pieces of advice I was given was by Lee Thompson when I first started doing stage magic. I would look down at the front row and I would just be captivated at looking down at the front row. And he watched my act and he said to me afterwards, you want to look out to everybody. You want to look at the whole audience at various different times because if you're not looking at them they're not going to engage with you but if you're looking out at various different audience members and you kind of almost like smiling and addressing this side of the room then this side of the room then this side of the room it feels like they're being brought into the show more than if you weren't doing that so my advice to you would be um yeah um first of all analyze whether there's a problem or not if there was a problem then think about how you can ad lib more, think about how you can improv more and make sure you're looking out at various different parts of the audience. The other piece of advice I would give you, and I give this to every single magician who wants to perform on stage and very few take it on, but if you do, you will become a better magician, is to take improv lessons, improv classes, or join an improv group for a few weeks because that experience will pay massive benefits. If you have the ability to improv and chat to the audience, Honestly, it's going to make the show a lot better. Okay, so the next question is from Magic Elliot, who said, uh, how you doing, by the way, buddy? Would you do a feature video of you and Ryland's key chains? Yes, uh, I've just done a video on what's in Ryland's close-up case, because that was asked for. Um, I'm planning on doing a keychain video very soon, and it's going to be one of both my keychain and Ryland's keychain, because we have different stuffs on our keychains. So yes, that is coming soon. Uh, thanks for that. Look out for it. It will be hitting at some point. Okay, so the next question is from Mago Antonio, who says, amazing video 
video as usual. Craig, thank you very much. Watching your video about Jeff Hobson and how simple and ordinary looking his props are, I thought about the next question. In Spain, there are lots of places that book magicians looking at photos of their show. And if you don't have big colorful boxes, birds and fire, you don't even get a chance. I have seen in cruise ships and hotels, extremely boring shows that get booked regularly simply because of the image. Being a magician with a, simpler, uh, with a similar approach to Jeff Hobson, how can I get a chance in those places? Well, my advice would be to put together a really good, very short showreel that shows that you're interacting with the audience. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, at least from my point of view as an entertainment agent, I, if I see a one minute video of somebody captiv captivating an entire audience, it doesn't matter if there's big boxes or not, or if there's fire or if there's birds, I don't care about that. If I see somebody holding a room captivated in the hands, um, that is what I gravitate towards every single time. So my advice to you would be to do that. My advice to you would be to reach out and put together a really short 60 to 90 second show reel, which just shows you performing in front of the sort of audiences that you want to perform in front of, whether it's hotels or whether it's uh, cruise liners. Keep it really short so that they don't lose their attention and just show clips of you performing and getting really great reactions. And then what I would do is I would lean into this as a branding and marketing ploy. So, you know, the best option to deal with something like this is to paint it red. It only becomes a problem if you avoid it or you ignore it. But if you paint it red, it be doesn't become an issue. So brand yourself as the stripped back illusionist or something like that, or brand yourself as the real magician and say, hey, you know, use it in your publicity. Hey, you'll see a lot of magicians going out there with big boxes and silks and handkerchiefs. I don't do that because I believe that the magic happens in the heads of the spectators. The magic happens in the hearts of the audience. You don't need a big box with colorful flowers on it to captivate an audience. You don't need animals to captivate an audience or an army of silk handkerchiefs. What you need is the ability to connect with the audience and you need the ability to make them laugh and hang on your every word. And, and that is what I do. With my performance, you're not gonna see big boxes, but instead I'm gonna use smaller custom designed illusions. And I'm gonna combine that with sleight of hand and psychology and audience interaction and comedy to create a show that will travel in any environment because I'm not going to take up the entire stage. Instead, I'm going to have every single audience remember, remembering every single moment of that show, not because of the boxes, because of me and my performance and what it gets them to feel inside or something like that. That is what I would do. I would paint it red and f make it a positive instead of a negative. Okay, so the next question is from Divisham Magician who says, what should you do if after loading a secret ball under a normal cup, someone says, lift up the cup or show me under the cup? Uh, honestly, and this isn't what you want to hear, but I'm going to tell you the truth. If people are saying lift up the cup or show me under the cup, it means that you need to think about your technique a little bit more. Because when you load something underneath a cup, whether it's a cups and balls routine or it's a chop cup routine or it's a whatever it is, my chop or anything like that, whatever routine you're using, when you load a ball secretly under a cup, there should be no suspicion at all that there is anything under there. And that's because it's loaded when people aren't looking and then you're focusing attention away. You're focusing over here that focuses on something else. The misdirection is pointing them in a different direction. So when you show that final load, the time misdirection means that they don't suspect or detect that anything was loaded under there. If you're loading something under there and they're saying, show me under the cup, then they suspect that something has gone under the cup, which means either your technique is bad, in which case, Think about your technique, film you performing the routine and watch to see if there's any tells that make it obvious that you're putting something under there. Or if your technique's not 
if your technique's fine, the other thing it might be is the routining and you're loading it at when precisely the wrong time. You don't want to be loading as something underneath a cup when everyone's attention is on the cup. The attention should be somewhere else. It's why cups and balls works because a lot of the time you're lifting up and showing a ball under there and the load happens as their attention is on that ball there. And so the attention isn't on the load. And if the people are catching you and saying, hey, let me see underneath the cup, it's because you're routining needs work and you need to think about when to load. There should be a massive disconnect between the actual moment of magic and the perceived moment of magic. And I've talked about this before on the channel. The actual moment of magic is when you do the load. In this case, it's, it's whenever the load happens. The perceived moment of magic is when you show that ball underneath the cup. There should be a disconnect so that they can't backtrack. And if your routining is bad and they see the balls loading underneath there, or if your technique's bad and they see the ball being loaded underneath there, that is the time that people will say, lift up or show me under the cup. Now, I could talk about different ways of doing it so that you can't, um, so that you can show the cup, like with my routine chop, I can show the cup at any point that I want to, that there's nothing underneath there. But my advice would be, if this is something that's happening to you on a regular enough basis that you're asking the question on Magic TV, I would focus primarily on looking at the routine, filming it a few times and re-routining it and working on your technique so that that never happens. Anytime I do cups and balls, I never have anyone say that. Anytime I do chop cup, I never have anyone say that. Anytime I do chop, I never say anyone say that. It's not that I'm the greatest magician in the world, because I'm not, but I'm very confident with the routining and I'm very confident with the technique to know that they're not going to catch anything. Uh, so the next question is again from Divisham Magician, who says, do you use a throw streamer? Have you ever done egg on fan like Ben Hart? Never done egg on fan like Ben Hart. Not a trick that appeals to me, although I think in Ben's hands, it's an absolute freaking miracle. Um, but do I use a throw streamer? Yes, I use it for one moment. Uh, I use two throw streamers when I'm doing... Uh, red carpet. So if you don't know what red carpet is, the idea is that uh, you have a bag over your head, you have somebody pick a, uh, pick a celebrity, they end up picking Spider-Man, and then when you take the bag off your head, you've got a Spider-Man mask on you. It's a very, very, very good routine. Um, and uh, what I've added to it is at the end of the routine, I... Whew, I act like I'm Spider-Man. I reach into my pocket. I grab two throw streamers and I've taken the hat, uh, the bag off and the see Spider-Man. Big reaction. And I go, of course, if this really was Spider-Man, uh, you know, and then I, I make the throw streamers appear and it looks like I'm throwing two webs. And it's like if I really was Spider-Man, I could make my, uh, I could throw webs a bit like this. And it's a really nice way to end that red carpet routine. That is the only time I use throw streamers. I use them as a gag at the end of the routine. I'm not the sort of magician or a manipulator that would use them in the context in which they're meant to be used for. Okay, so the next question is from Mick Anderson. Loving your channel, Craig. You have really got me back into magic again in the last six months. Um, you're very creative. Love the Morris coin set and apparition. Thank you very much. Give yourself a pat on the back. You always seem to do a lot for the community and always look forward to your posts every day. Mick, thank you very much. There's your pat on the back. I really appreciate it. There you go, guys. That's another Q&A in the bag. Thank you once again for joining me right here on a Sunday afternoon right here on Magic TV. I really appreciate it. Uh, don't forget, I've got a review show special coming up tonight. This week, we are going to be doing a uh, kind of an analysis between The End by, uh, by Angelo Carbone, the new book test by Angelo Carbone, and also the Jedi book test. Look out for that. Uh, also, don't forget, you want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment comment down below. If you haven't already done so, please go ahead and try out the Netrix. Uh, people ask me all the time, how can you support me? Uh, the best way is to go try out the Netrix for a month and see what a little fuss is about. I'm so passionate about making that the best place it can be. So go check that out. I will be back again soon. Thank you once again for joining me. My name's Craig from Magic TV.